For years, whenever I needed to upgrade my computer, I either went into the store or I ordered it online. I never paid any mind to the inner workings of the machine. I just needed it to work out of the box. I'm seeing some nods. You agree. This summer, though, my seven-year-old laptop was coming to its obvious end. And I spoke to some of my buddies who know a lot more about computers than I do, and I asked them if there was anything I should be looking out for. They all pointed me in very similar directions, and they also asked if I had considered building my own computer. <laughs> they recommended the website PCPartPicker.com which would help me choose exactly what I wanted and would show me how all of the pieces would work together. I'm sorry. Build my own? Do you know how many parts a computer has? Never have I ever had to think about a CPU, a CPU cooler, a motherboard, a memory, storage, video cards, a case for all of it, a power supply, an operating system, a monitor, and additional fans to keep the case cool? It was too much. It was incredibly daunting. But I was sold on the idea that by building my own computer, I could update the individual parts whenever there was an appropriate upgrade, rather than getting an entirely new computer every time. So I read a ton about all these parts, what they do. I watched way too many videos of people building computers. I was up for the challenge. And while it was a bit stressful, the process turned out to be very enjoyable and not as complicated as I thought it was going to be. The pieces mostly go into one spot and one spot only, right? I felt the most anxious when handling the most fragile components, but every video I watched, and my friends did too, they reassured me that these pieces would not break that I actually needed to, they actually needed to be connected firmly. Like I needed to click them in really hard for them to operate. And when everything was where it was supposed to be, I had confirmed and reconfirmed a few more times by watching the same videos over and over and over. I closed the case, powered on the computer, knowing that the machine would tell me if there was an error with any of my handiwork. The computer turned on. And I felt incredibly proud and accomplished. And I will tell you, the process was very worth it. And now, I know you're all sitting there thinking, Rabbi Calvin, are we really going to have to sit through another one of your nerdy sermons? What does any of this have to do with Judaism? Great questions. Thank you for asking. As a rabbi, I get asked a lot, what does Judaism say about blank? Sometimes, this is done facetiously, or even cynically, as though the person asking placed a bet years ago, and they're now trying to prove that they actually never needed to believe or practice something that they grew up with. Or, it's to help justify a decision that they have made to no longer believe or practice something now. Almost as though they are trying to prove to someone, themselves, a relative, God, prove that they no longer need some aspect of their Jewish identity. And usually this is the religious aspect. But more often than not, these questions come from a place of genuine curiosity as they try to better understand how Judaism can be relevant and applicable in their life. The question, what does Judaism say about blank, is an honest attempt to reconcile the perceived friction between tradition and modernity. And in answering this question, I do my best to highlight the inherited belief that there is tension between commandedness and autonomy. But I've always had an issue with this question because it seems to imply that there is a specific answer, that there is one singular truth that Judaism claims. But Judaism has hardly ever reached consensus about anything. There's an old expression, two Jews, three opinions. Jewish tradition is deeply rooted in debate, in discourse, in questioning. Jewish history has been one long attempt at balancing this dichotomy of preserving our stories, our laws, 
ritual practices while still making them relevant for each generation. Our first temple was destroyed. So we began reading Torah in the public marketplace, establishing our modern practice of reading Torah on Mondays and Thursdays in addition to Shabbat. Our prophets urged us to detach ourselves from the corrupt religious and political institutions of their day and instead refocus ourselves on a sense of equality they believe to be at the core of our teachings. And in doing so, they helped to create the strong sense of justice that many of us identify with our Judaism. Our second temple was destroyed. And a newly formed and very exclusive group of educators, the rabbis, pivoted to create prayer in order to fulfill the previously established daily obligations of sacrificial offerings. And many of these same rabbis embraced their curious inclination, working to clarify and systematize the mitzvot, the Torah commandments that require interpretation to make abstract rules for an ancient generation more accessible for a modern audience. Hundreds of years later, many of these rabbi students and schools further outlined daily Jewish life and practice by harmonizing earlier opinions about Jewish law. And what's so cool about this period of Jewish meaning making is that the rabbis preserve all opinions and perspectives on a given topic. They highlight that there has always been different practices and understandings of how we engage with our Judaism. And over the following millennium and a half, Judaism continued to evolve as Jews moved around and then settled in different parts of the world, taking influence and inspiration from the lands and people with whom they interacted. And it was during the later end of this period when the European Enlightenment greatly impacted the world, inspired the Jewish community to apply reason and intellect to their communal practices, eventually leading to the creation of both the Reform Movement and Zionism. Obviously, there have been countless other crucial developments influencing Judaism, especially in the 20th century alone, with the Shoah, the creation of the modern state of Israel, and feminism. But what I hope is becoming clear is that the question, what does Judaism say about blank, is incredibly difficult to answer. Since Judaism is constantly changing and has had different ways to answer that throughout its history. Before modernity, Judaism was a religion. It was a culture and a nationality. And when the reform movement emerged, Jews were seemingly presented with options by which they can now identify their Jewishness. There grew an obvious difference between tradition and modernity, between strict observance and autonomy. Reformjudaism.org highlights this historical tension by saying that in the first stages of Reform Judaism's development, Reform Jews abandoned codes of diet, dress, and ritual practices, which set them apart from their fellow citizens. The adaptations to modern culture, however, entailed sacrificing a Jewish identity that had defined the Jewish people for generations. When freed from the yoke of halakha from religious law, Judaism was recast as an all-encompassing way of life to a simply just a religion. Just as Christians worshiped in a church, Jews worshiped in a synagogue. But in all other respects, Jews were just as European or American as their non-Jewish neighbors next door. The more observant and traditional Jews claimed that this was a deviation from God's law, that reformers were illegitimate in their attempts at changing Jewish practice. Religion and religious law had defined Jews and Judaism for millennia, but the reform movement leaned in. They maintained that Judaism always evolved and that now Jews needed to be much more proactive and intentional with their adaptations, stressing autonomy for both, both individuals and communities. Just a few months ago in June, Rabbi Leon Morris gave a commencement speech at the Cincinnati campus of the Reform Movement Seminary the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. And he said, after two centuries of emphasizing personal autonomy and human freedom, today, our reform movement can declare victory in that campaign. Every modern Jew knows that they are free to make choices in all areas of their lives, particularly when it comes to religion, spiritual practice, and ritual. 
they need no reminder from the pulpit that they are free to choose. For them, for all of us, it is simply a given. They wouldn't assume otherwise. For better or for worse, personal choice has defined modernity and will continue to redefine Reform Judaism. When we gave our daughter the option to not eat the crust on her sandwiches, obviously she took that option. <laughs> right? There is no yummy nut butter or jelly jams, just dry, boring, nutritionally rich crust. When we give our 13-year-olds the option to make their own decision about staying involved in religious school after becoming B'nai Mitzvah, most of them are going to take that option, especially given how busy they are. The takeaway for many Reformed Jews is that personal choice means we don't feel commanded by some external, external force. There's zero obligation, so we can choose not to engage. And when we no longer engage with our Judaism, when we separate ourselves from our community, we become disconnected from the myriad changes that take place within that community. And after some time away, it's fair to assume that we will have some questions about updates to practices, rituals, and traditions. Questions like, what does Judaism say about blank? And when we ask these kinds of questions, it feels as though we are outsourcing knowledge and wisdom to those who are seen as more legitimate. Our tradition has always idealized the practicing Jew. And as Reformed Jews moved into modernity and towards progress, we let tradition and those who would hold fast to it claim authority and authenticity. Perhaps it was because the changes we were making created new interpretive precedents and couldn't solely rely on support from a tradition established in its ways long before modernity. Perhaps it was because of the kinds of tweaks we were making, forcing Judaism to work for us rather than us trying to fit within the, nicely within the boundaries of the fences our sages taught us to build around the Torah. We have been busy creating a Judaism that is more inclusive, that is more experimental, that is more expansive. Reformed Jews shed our identity of obligation in favor of personal choice, redefining ourselves through the lens of cultural and secular affiliations. And in that process, we were convinced by the more observant to exchange our birthright for a bowl of matzo ball soup at the deli. And many of us have been left with lingering and underlying questions seeking validation. Am I Jewish enough? I want to share three examples from my own life experience when I found myself confronted by this question, second-guessing my own claims to my Jewish identity. In 2006, I was in college teaching religious school. Our curriculum was to highlight certain mitzvot that felt more approachable for our seventh graders. My teaching team divvied up the list, and we each wrote lesson plans accordingly. Most of mine were easy. Keep Shabbat, honor your elders, affix a mezuzah on your doorposts. But I was thrown by the mitzvah of keeping kosher. I didn't know where to start. What part of don't boil a kid in its mother's milk do I focus on? The not mixing milk and meats? Not being unnecessarily cruel to an animal by cooking its spawn in the milk meant to nourish it? But what really got me was a feeling of inauthenticity around teaching my students something that I didn't practice or fully understand. And so I dove deep. I learned a lot about the intricacies of kashrut laws. And ultimately, I ended up keeping kosher myself for about three years, which then evolved into vegetarianism, mostly because it was actually easier to manage eating out at restaurants. But that ended quickly, when during the summer of 2010, I participated in an admittedly very silly summer camp food tradition by eating steaks while camping on the beach. I didn't want to miss out on the bonding, so I ate the steaks. I actually ate three. <laughs> and I felt zero regret. For the next year or so, I ate whatever I wanted. I ate pork, shellfish. I was mixing milk and meat 
I ate blood sausage. Oh. And then one day, I was recommended a book, Eating Animals by Jonathan Safran Foer. I immediately became a vegetarian again, and this time there was no turning back. And what I realized in reading this book was that I had been keeping kosher just because and began initially practicing vegetarianism out of sheer convenience. I had never considered applying a personal intentionality to my practice. I had never acknowledged the factory farm system, the toll it was taken on our earth and the horrendous conditions those animals endured during their brief lives. And even though our tradition prohibits tsa'ar ba'alei chayim, causing pain to animals, according to some traditions of halakha, of Jewish law, it is forbidden to become vegetarian solely based on not wanting to kill animals. Maimonides even declared it a mitzvah to eat meat on holidays, as it's the only way to increase one's rejoicing. And he clearly knew a lot about Jewish law, but I'd like to think that if he was alive today, Maimonides would have a different view given the meat industry's impact on the climate crisis. There was nothing kosher about my previous eating habits. It didn't align with my values. And I was inspired to make a change, one that was fit for my life. And now I'm a vegetarian who, by default, is kosher. And my kosher practice is concerned for animal welfare. I keep kosher by being aware of my eating habits and their impact on the planet. I choose to connect to a rich Jewish food tradition by being intentional whenever and however I eat. In 2015, I was accepted into the rabbinical program at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, and I was about to move to Jerusalem for the year. I had just finished five years as full-time youth director here at Temple Israel of Hollywood, and my time here was filled with personal and professional growth, and over those years, I was always gently nudged to apply for rabbinical school, something that I probably should have seen coming after I started keeping kosher, prepping to teach a 40-minute lesson for seventh graders. But before I was accepted, the in-person interview ended with the standard, you got any questions for us? Um, yeah. So my dad is Jewish, but my mom is Catholic. Am I gonna have to convert? Or at least have some kind of like affirmation ceremony? And while the faculty all looked at each other, trying to figure out which one of them was going to reassure me, I had already clocked Rabbi Devorah Weisberg at the end of the table, furiously shaking her head, as though she was emphatically signaling to whoever wanted to field this one that there was no cause for concern. I was told such, and I left. But I still emailed Rabbi Devorah because I just wanted to chat just a little bit more. And so we set up a meeting, and I came in. She was incredibly generous and gracious with her time. And I told her that I was fully aware of the reform movement's rulings on patrilineal descent, and that I knew that the child in question must have been raised with holiday observances, ritual practices, etc. I checked all of these boxes. At this point in my life, I had gone to religious school. I'd become bar mitzvah. I had grown up at a Jewish sleepaway camp for 16 years straight and had taught at two different temples. I explained that my primary concern was for my future congregants, specifically for ones who came from a more conservative or traditional background. I was worried that they might be uncomfortable if they discovered that my Jewish upbringing didn't align with how they understood Jewish identity. And for those who don't know, more traditional denominations of Judaism track Jewishness through the mother. And in their eyes, I am not considered fully Jewish. I would need to have a traditional and halakhically approved conversion in order to validate my identity as a Jew. When I was finished venting my anxieties, Rabbi Devorah calmly explained to me that I was Jewish, that Reform Judaism proudly acknowledges and accepts anyone as Jewish if they have one parent who is Jewish and that there was a semblance of intentional Jewish practice during that individual's upbringing. She also said that if any congregant takes issue with this, they should reflect on why they left their more traditional community for a reform one. <laughs> so I went to Israel and experienced that country in all of its complexity. 
I struggled through the language. I struggled through having to deal with an Israeli landlord. I struggled through constant reminders that although the majority of the country's Jews consider themselves Heloni, secular, there is a loud and growing number of religious Jews who are working to preserve traditional practices and understandings of Jewishness at the expense of anyone else who calls that land home. And during my year there, I also discovered that there is a small but growing reform movement. I even had an internship at one of the congregations. These are incredible communities that subscribe to liberal and progressive ideals and want Israel to be a place where they can express those values comfortably. I came back from Israel feeling validated by my choice to pursue a life of Jewish professionalism. I was excited to continue training at HUCJIR, honing my skills to be a better service to my future communities, to help them navigate some of their own big questions, always reinforcing that their path was true and that their choices mattered. Earlier this summer, I was asked to co-officiate a wedding for one of my old campers. We met over Zoom so I could get to know them a bit better as a couple, and I learned that her fiance had grown up as modern Orthodox. They both spoke about how much they appreciated each other's Jewish upbringings, how their different perspectives helped to inform their relationship and the choices they make as a Jewish couple. He even described his communal and personal practice as muscle memory Judaism, that there was never a whole lot of thinking about the meaning behind the practice. We concluded our meeting, and they said that the fiance's childhood Orthodox rabbi was going to lead parts of the ceremony, but that the couple had spoken about how important it was to her that she also felt represented under the chuppah by having a rabbi present who knew her and her Judaism. A month before the wedding, I got a text from her saying, hi, so the rabbi isn't okay with my strapless dress and I am firm on the boundary of not changing what I've chosen to wear. So he's gonna to try to find another Orthodox rabbi who is okay with it, but we may end up needing you for the whole shebang. Okay, thanks. <laughs> we texted back and forth a few more times leading up to the wedding, and they indeed found another Orthodox rabbi to step in. And I was told that this rabbi would be in touch with me before the ceremony. He was not. And it wasn't until the day before the wedding that the wedding planner sent me an outline of the ceremony. And as I read through it, it seems as though the Orthodox rabbi was going to be leading pretty much all of it. But there were a few question marks, so I figured he and I would speak before the wedding, and we'd sort it out. The afternoon of the simcha, I got to the venue. I hugged the couple. They looked happy, excited, loved. I met the other rabbi, incredibly nice guy, like super friendly. And then I started meeting the groom's Orthodox family. And when I say meet, I mean quick hellos with hardly any acknowledgement of my presence. They were much more generous with the Orthodox rabbi. I even heard the groom's mother say a few times before the ceremony, Baruch Hashem, Rabbi, thank God you're here. You really saved the day. <laughs> Strong start. <laughs> Just before the ceremony began, the other rabbi and I were schmoozing under the chuppah, waiting for the green light from the wedding planner. I was organizing my folder now that I had a clear understanding of what I would be leading, and I know you're all worried. Trust me, my part was still substantial. <laughs> Once I felt good, I put my folder down, prepared to put on my talit, which I usually wear for these ceremonies as a part of my uniform. Fun fact. Halakhically, an outward-facing talit is only to be worn during early morning prayer services, as the mitzvah pertains to the ability to see and remember the commandments. And the rabbis determined that you need morning light in order to distinguish between your talit and the fields in which you were praying, specifically to determine the color of the dye that you were using. See, yada, 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 great. Today, though, many reform rabbis, we here at TIOH included, choose to wear a talit whenever we conduct a service, especially on a Friday night since not only has it become so widespread as to normalize the practice in the reform movement, but it usually is the only time many of our members of our adult community see us. They see the rabbis. And this talit helps us to look the part, make us a little bit more official. Back to the wedding. In the past, 
The only time I don't wear my tallit at a wedding ceremony is when it's too windy and it would become a distraction. And knowing all this about the halakha, I was already questioning whether I wanted to wear my tallit during this early evening ceremony because of what it might cause the more traditional and observant sides of the family to think of me as a rabbi. You should also know that it was a very schwitzy 97 degrees, just entirely too balmy and sticky for a 6.30 p.m. ceremony, with the chuppah directly in the setting sun. I had an out, halakhically and meteorologically. All right? I did not need to wear this talit. And I could still feel the other rabbi watching me, trying to figure out if he needed to jump in to remind me what Jewish law said. So I mentioned the heat. And in what seems like an out that I had gifted him, he very nicely said, oh, of course, no, it's too hot to wear that. That's crazy. So the ceremony began. And I chose not to wear the talit because of the heat. And the Orthodox rabbi officiated over the more traditional moments of the service. He led the ketubah ceremony beforehand. And he even framed it as an acquiring of the bride by the groom. And that the commitments listed on the document were only being made and agreed upon by the groom. He led the erosin, the ring exchange, under the chuppah. And he even found two other witnesses because originally, the two witnesses chosen by the couple were family members. And this is forbidden in halakha. The rabbi even asked these two new witnesses to do tshuva before they stepped up to serve as witness. And this was literally like two minutes before the ceremony started. This is how he saved the day. By overseeing the legally binding parts of the ceremony so it would be considered official. But all of these legally binding moments were done off the microphone, just spoken to the groom. The bride was hardly involved in the process, and the people gathered to help celebrate them were sitting through a good chunk of the service in silence. When it was appropriate, and as a part of my role, I transitioned through some of these silent moments, helping to explain what we were doing and why bringing not only an awareness of the significance behind these rituals, but also as an inclusion of the community who was invited to share in these moments. The ceremony ended. The happy couple rejoiced. And throughout the rest of the evening, so many people, including the groom's Orthodox family, found me to tell me how beautiful the ceremony was and how grateful they were for my framing of the rituals. And did I mention I was the only rabbi who stayed to dance? I think we have taken our reform heritage for granted. At some point in history, it became entangled with our own American identities and we lost track of the meaning behind freedom and progressive values as they pertain to our Judaism. Maybe we have focused too much on secular dynamics of expanding our organizational tent to be too inclusive of universal values rather than just ones found in Judaism. The reform movement has even been criticized for treating Judaism like a buffet, that we go down the line only taking what we want. Yes, just because it's being served doesn't mean you have to eat it. Our reform tradition has never accepted a straight from the box Judaism. We have chosen exactly which parts serve us in modernity and we have pieced them together to make a functioning product. And then, we upgrade when we need to. We need to stop letting orthodoxy determine what Judaism says about our tradition, about Israel, about our Jewishness. Instead, we need to relearn how to feel empowered with the decisions that we make and stand by those convictions. We have defaulted to a place where cultural Jew is used as an excuse not to engage with our tradition. I've heard so many refer to themselves as reformed Jews, as though our identity somehow stopped developing a while back. We are the reform movements. There has been and will always be forward progress. We're able to sit next to each other at services without having a percentage of our community sit behind a barrier. We have two female rabbis and a female cantor, and nobody challenges 
hearing a woman's voice lead us in prayer. We have chosen to blow shofar every Shabbat this past month, and we will even offer a vino malkeno on Yom Kippur, even though, per our tradition, neither is permitted on Shabbat. You are not a lesser Jew if you eat bacon, if you don't know Hebrew, if you have concerns and questions about Israel, or if you only show up to temple once a year for the high holidays. You are still showing up, and you are still engaging with your Jewish identity whenever these actions trigger questions of authenticity for you. My practice has changed. It has evolved, and it has changed again. Judaism should be flexible enough to flow with me. And you know what? The reform movement is. It always has been. And we don't need to handle our Judaism with as much care as we may think. Our tradition has gone through a lot. We are not going to break it. I refuse to let us be a muscle memory Judaism. But I do think that we need to work that muscle. We are Israel. We are God wrestlers. And the reform movement has always been better equipped to handle what modernity throws our way because we are proactive with our practice. We don't just read about Jewish values in our text. We go out and we enact them. We see the problems out in the world, and we are on the front lines helping to fix them. This has always been our ever-evolving identity. This is the gift that we hand down to the next generation, and we need to do a better job at preparing them with the necessary skills to ensure that they also feel empowered to make informed choices and act accordingly. There is no monopoly over thought or practice in Judaism, regardless of the, what the more observant streams of Judaism want us to believe. Some of the most traditional don't even see us as real Jews. That is fine. They do not speak for us. As we enter a new year, I want to bless all of us with purposeful practice and empower each of us to bring personal intentionality to our choices. Sure, many of us don't feel the same sense of obligation, but we need to remember that we were invited. We deserve to be here. And you are always welcome here in the Reform Movement at Temple Israel of Hollywood, just as you are. And we can't wait to hear what you have to say about Judaism.